Okay, <clears throat> hello everybody um, and welcome to this uh, uh, session of uh, Ship of a New Story. Uh, my name is Mats Eliasson. Uh, I'm the moderator for this uh, session and uh, the topic uh, today is going to be uh, building uh, the future and uh, with me here in the panel I have uh, uh, Magnus uh, Quant. He's uh, currently uh, in Lund, in Sweden. We have uh, James Ehrlich joining us from California, uh, Palo Alto in the middle of the night. Thank you, James, for staying up late or getting up early, I would say. We have uh, Dimitri Aleshko from um, uh, Helsingborg, joining us from Helsingborg. And then we have Marina Nart, she is in Stockholm. And uh, myself, I'm currently in Malmö. So we're a little bit spread out uh, with the focus on, on uh, the Nordic region or Sweden. Uh, I'm just very shortly going to present uh, the uh, ship of a new story. It's this uh, session of um, uh, live broadcast sessions, panel discussions uh, throughout this week uh, as a little bit of an alternative to Almedalen event at Gotland. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think it's running really, really well. Um, I was on a panel earlier this week on a ship sailing from Sweden to Denmark back and forth. Uh, so, uh, but I think today we're, we're um, broadcasting from Ideon Lund, where you are, Magnus. Um, I, I'm, let you, I'm gonna let you present yourself, uh, each one of you uh, quite briefly, and then we will jump into the, the topic, which is building a, the future. And, and I want to be really concrete uh, during this panel and uh, really sort of look into what we can do instead of uh, talking is important, of course, in meeting, but we need to put the shovel in the ground, uh, the propeller in the water or whatever you want to call it in order to, to get movement uh, forward. So um, shall we start with uh, Magnus? Please uh, tell you a little bit about yourself and your take on this building the future. Yes. I'm working on uh, urban resilience and have been doing so, so since 2010, which was quite a, early on, on on this topic of uh, urban resilience, at least here in the, in the Nordics. So I've seen how this uh, perspective on, on how to form cities and how to collaborate cross-border has uh, evolved uh, over the last 10 years. I've seen how Rockefeller have put their money in into 100 Resilient Cities uh, Challenge and Network, and also how you inhabitat, UNDRR, ICLE, C40, and many others uh, start focusing on resilience, which seems to be a, an even harder topic uh, at this very moment during the uh, COVID-19 situation. My uh, background is that I'm a fire protection engineer. I've been working for the civil uh, continuous agency for many years here in Sweden, uh, but become more and more interested in uh, design and, and how we can uh, actually build uh, for the future uh, our new cities. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Magnus. Shall we um, turn over to James? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Dialing in from Stanford University here in Palo Alto, California, for 04 a.m. for me. Uh, I'm James Ehrlich, founder of Regen Villages, which is also has a Swedish subsidiary, Regen Villages AB. And uh, we are basically uh, creating the future of living outside of cities, uh, near suburban, peri-urban, and ultimately rural areas in self-sustaining technology enabled AI, ML, uh, machine learning enabled kind of communities for the benefit of flourishing. And that's really the topic also of my research that I continue at Stanford as part of the Stanford University Flourishing Project in the School of Medicine. Uh, just very briefly, I'm also a faculty member at Singularity University, senior fellow at NASA Ames Research Center, and under the Obama administration uh, was appointed to a White House uh, joint uh, State Department Task Force on Regenerative Infrastructure. So it is about resiliency, uh, about critical life support systems, really food, water, energy, and circular waste systems uh, at the neighborhood scale. So really great to be here. Thanks. Super. 
So we continue with uh, Dimitri. Hi, my, na my name is Dimitri. Uh, I'm, I call myself a serial entrepreneur uh, just because uh, I'm an engineer and uh, I started with uh, small startups uh, my, uh, my career. And then it just like uh, became my lifestyle where I just uh, go inside the companies, uh, help them to, to grow. Uh, I'm co-founder of uh, a bunch of, of them. And, and this is uh, one of my takeoffs. I think that uh, as the future will be more uh, uh, run by entrepreneurs where we will, uh, instead of big corporation companies, uh, will solve our problems we uh, as entrepreneurs can find and solve those micro problems and uh, and also get more sustainable solution uh, on top of that uh, my biggest passion is education where i uh, i have a couple of projects uh, where i educate both grown ups how to be a programmer how to be an engineer uh, and also kids where we teach them how to program how to uh, do really cool stuff uh, and and compete uh, also. Okay, super. Thank you so much. And then we have uh, Marina joining us from Stockholm. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. So my name is Marina Nart, and I work with uh, sustainability. Uh, my my take is uh, from science. I have a sustainability science background from actually Lund. Uh, university <laughs> that's what I started and uh, yeah so what I, I did is I founded the beyond 2030 project so I help organization mainly as entrepreneurs uh, and startups to go beyond the SDGs meaning to uh, have a science approach because the SDGs and sustainable and the SDGs and the agenda 2030 are mainly a political and global a compromise if we want or a negotiation <laughs> so at the local level is where the action happened and there we can do better and we can do uh, the best we can so we don't need to uh, restrict ourselves and i think this um, sustainability is in a mindset in that sense and uh, uh, we need to um, contribute and entrepreneurs are a bit of my passion right now i worked before with communities and uh, universities and uh, uh, municipalities uh, mainly and now i, I like to bring in uh, the entrepreneurs and uh, help them contribute in an authentic way. So that's what I'm doing now. Super, thank you so much. Uh, I will just finish uh, by telling you a little bit about myself. My name is Mads Eliasson. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And um, as I <laughs> said earlier on a panel this week, uh, I'm a man with different hats or several hats. Uh, <clears throat> and that's quite interesting uh, because then you, you get to see a lot of um, uh, things from different uh, sectors and, and uh, meet different people with different views and backgrounds, etc. And I think that's, for me, anyway, very, very stimulating and, and um, a good thing going forward, trying to, to address the uh, large, most big problems that, and challenges that we are, are, are facing uh, uh, right now. Uh, I've been meeting some of you. I met Magnus a couple of years uh, back, so I know Magnus and what he's been doing. And of course, James, I've been working with, with James as well. We, we, we have been um, exploring the um, Swedish uh, opportunity for establishing region villages here in Sweden, which has been uh, both um, interesting, but also at the same time frustrating. Uh, <clears throat> to, to, to see what's needed and trying to get the, the shovel in the ground. Uh, so, um, to build the future, there are uh, obstacles and, and challenges that we need to, to, to address. What would you think would be the, the, the largest uh, uh, obstacles from, from your perspective? Shall we start with uh, Dimitri this uh, time? Uh, thank you. Um, I think education is one of the most uh, uh, important things just because uh, whatever we do, whatever we talk right now about or whatever dreams we have or goals uh, uh, or visions, if we don't start with educating both kids and, and grown-ups on university and schools uh, uh, about uh, how, how we need to transform us, to, to change uh, ourselves, uh, to, to fit to the future. Um, and to, to, to those goals, uh, we, it will take too much long time. So uh, my takeoff of that is that we, we need to start to work 
already like from kindergarten uh, to talk about those topics. Um, and this is really, really, really important uh, personally for me. Okay. How could, how could that be done uh, in more practical ways? How could we start next week? Uh, if, if I see like what Sweden is doing, uh, uh, for example, there are like uh, European goals uh, uh, 2035. Uh, there are quite a lot of working with, with talking to teachers and uh, already doing different types of cases with kids. Uh, so next week we can just uh, send some type of or create some type of competition where we uh, we send some material to to teachers to be able to uh, uh, to, to to teach kids and they can contribute uh, how do they see the future uh, what what uh, what 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 do they mean by by saying future uh, so we can start to learn from them as well because we're creating future not for us for our kids uh, may I add to that, Mats? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, we have a situation now where, uh, at least here in, in Sweden, most uh, high school students, they have not been allowed to, to go to school. They have, have these uh, uh, distance learning projects. They have been uh, uh, online uh, participating in different uh, seminars and, and lectures and being tutored online as well. And I think now when, when when we start having time to digest the experience we have from this, I think we will see a new kind of pedagogical form transforming into to schools. So, and I'm very hopeful for that. I think that we can see much more of a problem-oriented uh, curriculum in, in the future where students are more free to investigate, participate in online uh, lectures, uh, picking up things from, from other places in the world rather than just their own teacher and the recommend and the, the textbooks. So I think we, we the situation we are are leading in us in, in an accelerated, transforming way when it comes to to, to training and uh, schooling of the new professionals uh, for the future. Yeah. You, James, you are at the middle of Stanford, which is uh, of course big in terms of training and education. So what, what would you say about this? Well, I think everything is uh, changing precipitously around the world. Uh, and that has a lot to do with, of course, people being forced to work from home, but also the realization uh, from companies, industry, careers, where, what's the direction of the future of work, which I think previously, and this is germane to this, this topic, has always been about this funnel towards jobs, right? And I think really what we're arguing about here, talking about here is this idea of, of free thinking that people can create self-worth. And, uh, and our perspective, of course, as you know, Mats, really well, is the ecological ring of flourishing. So if you have your basic Maslow of hierarchical needs met, clean water, clean food, clean energy, uh, hygiene, energy, positive, nice place to be living in, you feel secure in that, then anything's possible in terms of creating the kind of curriculum that uh, our next generations are gonna need to um, keep fostering that flourishing. So that's, I would say my soapbox on that topic. I read uh, from uh, your, your uh, um email to me, Marina, that you are, are uh, very much into the, the social uh, dimension and social part and looking at ourselves as, as human beings. What would you say regarding the, the, the obstacles to get, to get going? Because it starts with yourself, doesn't it? Yeah, that's so true. Um, yeah, I would like to comment a link to what's been said so far, because I'm, I'm also a big fan of education as the the, the best long-term strategy and I'm really glad to hear the reflection about how corona maybe create new opportunities that we might need to take um, um, and I wanted to comment about the fact that we have a generation in between the ch children and, and the young adults and adults that are the most active and the most committed and uh, I would say they are doing uh, they are being the change we want to see I, I mean the greater generation I would say and all her peers and I think that that gives me a lot of hope. Um, and I think that we have, I mean, anybody above their 
so to speak, uh, generation, I think has a responsibility to help them make their um, lifestyle and beliefs and uh, needs uh, real. So brands, um, the, uh, the education system, uh, the pedagogies and everything, we all have a responsibility to change as fast as possible because they are ready. I mean, we all are in, in this kind of community, but we have a whole generation ready that will come to um, well, the market to workplaces and to um, there will be there will be the new entrepreneurs and the new colleagues we will have very soon, and they are very informed, aware, and willing to go full in. So it's pretty much a generational shift that is already happening, in my opinion. So I'm very hopeful. Um, and when it comes to my own perspective, I have found I've started. Um, I mean, I moved country for sustainability, and I thought when I started, I thought, yeah. It's pretty pretty straightforward, and uh, it's all about going out and help and start helping out. And then I, it took um, seven years for me to start talking about sustainability in a way that people didn't just start looking away and asking me, "What do you even mean?" You know, it, it's just last year that this became a big topic. So um, I would say media influence is very important, but of course, as you said, it starts within. And my approach is to think about um, sustainability as a mindset instead of trying to learn new things and trying to always feeling like am i being holistic enough am i really being consistent am i being co coherent with what i'm saying i'm believing in and i'm standing for i think one could just uh, um go into uh you know deep self-reflection <laughs> and start from uh, question your limiting beliefs that makes you feel that maybe this is not for you fully or that you cannot go full in and that you maybe need to compromise and that's okay maybe one can start with uh, with going through why do you believe that is it because we are social animal and we are affected by our group and our society and when i work with people from other countries just within europe it can be so different how much people are uh caring about different topics right so it is we are very much affected by our context so maybe we can start by creating an um uh, cleaning up our context and trying to um by <laughs> live a lifestyle, uh, including our relationships that is fully embracing um, the values and, and, and is willing to put them in action. Because once we build a critical mass, then I believe that uh, that will um, snowball uh, many other things. It's about fully embracing it or not. There is no way to be a little bit more sustainable. Either you are in or not. It's a paradigmatic shift that you need to make. So it's yeah. you just it's like jumping. like it, it will feel you will be judged and you will be criticized, but you know, um, hopefully today it feels a bit more uh, safe to do. <laughs> That's what okay. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it says here in the um, invitation or, or, or the description of, of, of this uh, panel that uh, it says, how, how can building and refurbishing be done in the best world for world manner? And I know of course that James, you've been sort of uh, building this concept of how we should sort of not only put the shovel in the ground, but, but live in the future with your concept region villages. Can you please uh, tell us a little bit about it and please share some uh, slides yeah. if you have that too. I think that would be interesting for all of us. So excited to do that. And I'm so grateful actually for this opportunity to share my screen. Uh, so I grew up in New York City. I grew up in a very dense urban area and uh, it's wonderful, it's vibrant, it's incredible and also incredibly brittle. And I was deeply influenced by how brittle and how fragile um, uh, this idea of resiliency in urban areas is. Um, and so when I had come to Stanford, uh, I came through this circuitous route of software development and video game design and development and had a, a really great run up in Northern California, north of Silicon Valley but I was surrounded by these incredible organic biodynamic family farms. And I was really um, deeply impacted by the work of Rudolf Steiner, uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, Bill Mollison from Australia on the idea of permaculture. And what does this mean? This is these, these symbiotic kinds of farm to table uh, communities. And um, long story short, that led me to an adjunct uh, career as an entrepreneur uh, in producing a national uh, U.S. public television cooking series called Organic Living, uh, but the stories were more than just about these farm-to-table communities. They were also about um, the infrastructure of uh, solar, wind, water purification, uh, electric vehicles. You know, this is, these are the things that that these kinds of intentional communities were really bringing to the fore. 
um, and I and I was so uh, you know blown away with this idea that I was looking for actually a software connection to nature. This idea of a digital mycelial mushroom kind of network, if you will. Uh, and again, I you know came to Stanford in 2012. I was inspired by this work of Dr. Suzanne Simard from the University of British Columbia, who had come up with this lovely term called the Wood Wide Web versus the World Wide Web, which is this mycorrhizal mycelial bundle uh, under the forest floor that is a collaborative economy. It's a have need network um, where essentially you have these old growth trees that are supporting different species seedlings hundreds of meters away with all kinds of flows of nutrients and carbon and minerals, et cetera. Um, and there's only one reason for that because the forest agreed that that seedling needs to come to maturity because there's a long-term economic ledger benefit for everybody. Uh, I think a very beautiful metaphor for the future of, of human uh, economics. Um, but I took this into an idea around real estate development, especially uh, subdivision, uh, near suburban, peri-urban and rural greenfield developments that we could use software and machine learning to design and define these kinds of communities in such a way that, um, that they are regenerative and resilient in food, water, energy, and circular waste systems in connectivity with these quote unquote smart energy positive homes. And so you get this picture really of a master plan of a lot of really beautiful, delicious uh, food at your doorstep, biodiverse, full menu, connected to a social economic system, to the community and the wider community. Very different farming model, economically speaking, by the way. Um, and that we can marry that with, especially for cold weather climate context or arid context, uh, like in Sweden and Norway and the Nordics, this idea of vertical farming with aquaponics and aeroponics, all the different fish protein, their waste is actually nutrients for the cultivars. Um, and you have this beautiful web of life, essentially, that the software, our village operating system can take to design and define sort of a virtual sim city, if you will, of land grants into those beautiful kinds of communities. And then that same software is the farmhouse server to actually run the regenerative infrastructure of that community. Now imagine from a, an Elon Musk perspective or Buckminster Fuller perspective of these neighborhoods being able to communicate with each other across climate zones. And you start to get a really exciting idea of the sentient neighborhood in benefit to human flourishing. That's the key thing. It's not about data and that we're products of data uh, or vice versa, but actually the data can be there to support our thriving and our flourishing. And um, yes, we are a Stanford spinoff. We created a Dutch holding company. We have a Swedish subsidiary, also an office in, in London and here in California, one coming soon to Canada. And uh, we're a very strange multinational startup. But the bottom line is we're all about this one main cause, which is creating the future of living in self-sustaining small communities, especially for the peri-urban and rural areas, which now we're seeing an exodus towards. So I'll leave it there. And I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that was a concrete example of, of uh, how it could sort of be done and how we can meet the challenges uh, that are uh, ahead of us. And um, I, I want to talk a little bit about de-urbanization because um, I think that is a trend that is where I think I know that is a trend. Uh, and I recently just spoke to a researcher at the university in Sweden uh, and he, she and her colleagues are studying this, this new trend, are doing interviews with, with uh, families uh, that are, are either thinking of moving or have moved uh, outside the city. So I think that the, the force is, is uh, sort of turning 180 degrees. Uh, so it will be interesting to hear a little bit of, of your thinking about and your take on, on de-urbanization and how we should think uh, in terms of meeting that with building the future. Magnus, well, how, could you start? Or would you start, James? Yeah, I just wanted to say really quickly that for many years, people thought I was literally certifiably insane for thinking outside of cities. So um, now people are beginning to apologize, I guess. But anyway, go ahead, Magnus, sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the, 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 this trend of, of uh, moving in and out of cities is kind of uh, coming in waves. We have seen this in the, the during the 70s in Sweden, where where people moved out from cities in, into the suburbs, etc. I think uh, it is. Um, probably uh, like that it's gonna gonna keep on waving back and forth but i still think uh, the cities or, or the urban life is is uh, still valid in the future so it's not kind of a, a, a either or but we're gonna have both at the same time so so from my perspective i see some uh, things gonna uh, kind of working in in a positive way for for de-urbanization for for example is autonomous cars, I think, will, will uh, make uh, commuting uh, to cities uh, more beneficial because you can actually uh, use the commuting time. And in, in that perspective, the, the disadvantage of living outside the cities, having long commuting times to, to work, etc., uh, those are kind of uh, not valid anymore in the future. So, so um, I can see that. But I think also, uh, there is a there is a trend that we should uh, um, make our cities uh, even more dense. For example, right now at the very, this very moment, there is a big trend in, in Europe: make our cities more dense. And at some point, that's going to go in conflict of, of greening cities, having parks, having space. I think that will be question after after this uh, time of the pandemics from COVID. Can we really make our cities more dense? So, so I would uh, probably uh, suggest that we need to look into how can we make uh, the suburban areas more connected to, to the urban life and, and make it kind of a urban rural uh, thing. That's why I like I like the word urban uh, as we use it in urban resilience, for example, is the, instead of city resilience because cities have a have a strict city border. But urban areas is, is kind of including going out into to the the neighboring areas and and the space in between cities, which I think is is has a huge potential, especially where we live here in Malmö Lund. It's a twenty minute twenty minute commuting time between those two cities, and we can see how how those Malmö Lund are kind of sprawling and growing together uh, in that way. So so there is a potential. And then we are in conflict with the, the with the, this great farming land that we have here in, in southern Sweden. So there is a lot of questions to be raised and, and, and investigate and, and elaborate on, on how we're going to move forward. But definitely, I think there is always a, a, a waving trend moving into cities, moving out from cities, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Anybody else, Marina? What is what's your take on on de-urbanization and, and uh, the the decision of of actually either moving out of the city or or into the city or taking this family, uh, etc. Uh, from from a sort of um, individual social perspective. Yeah, that's um, that's interesting because it's almost. Um, going against the trend that has been the most the strongest trend right Un until now and i think the pandemic added a new layer that wasn't necessarily there before um i work with urban designers a lot and uh, <laughs> i i believe that uh, there are the i mean ideally one could have uh, both options uh, if that would be a possibility that's how it's uh, I, I think that's a little bit how it works in sweden that there is this double concept of living in the city for work purposes, but then having a place to go to that is more like in the in the countryside, and that's uh, very good from a mental health perspective, and also from a yeah, um, I would say mental health would be the the, the main advantage for perhaps for being outside a city. Um, I think um, from a sustainability perspective, one needs to look at a from a systemic perspective and understand. Um, it, I mean, if the global population keeps growing, maybe. If everybody maybe doesn't get to do that, so maybe it becomes again a luxury. Um, so maybe now the luxury is living it downtown, and in the future maybe the luxury is to have this um, maybe more re remote location where it's so self-sufficient as uh, I've seen in the in life. 
um, it's a tough one. I think it's a personal uh, pre preference. Um, I think there is an anonymity layer in a city that really helps a lot of people. Uh, but now that we can be all uh, connected digitally, maybe that will change as well. Uh, and I think that even if we do communities outside cities, we might need to uh, densify a little bit because of course we cannot like sprawling would be maybe undermining the whole purpose of uh, doing things in a good way or organic and uh, uh, ecological and everything, including the buildings and everything. So I, I'm just um, wondering about the tech side. The tech side would make a lot of sense, uh, although of course it always comes with, um, you know, um, side effects. So I, I, I would say it's a matter of, um, how many people get to do that in the end from a social perspective. I, I wonder if you maybe have um, looked into um, the, like how do you not exploit the land while building on the land and while allowing many people to live on, the, on that concept? Does this become a new type of city in the long run or I don't know, uh, or should it be exclusive and should it have a cap of how many people can live there for it to make sense? Um, and then Maybe you want to co co comment on that a little bit, James? I know uh, uh, around building the, on, on farmland, <laughs> the question. This is the, the, the kernel uh, concept behind the village operating system software is to take the GIS, the geospatial information of a land grant um, and feed that into software that, that will allow us to, uh, with a kit of parts, basically, <laughs> essentially uh, SimCity plan how much density uh, that natural space can support in mm -hmm. food, water, energy, and waste if and when those district scale services are interrupted. So the whole idea really of the software is to create the circumstances for this absolute exodus. There's no, we're not talking about trends anymore. Trends are, are like these delicate sort of movements. We're talking about an exodus mm -hmm. from cities around the world. Probably different in Sweden because of how you guys have handled things. But, but certainly the rest of the world, you look at any of the metrics right now, um, anybody with money or people even without are leaving the cities um, in droves. And, and then just, you know, just briefly what you said, uh, you know, Marina, about, about mental health, that people have, it's funny you say that people go out of the city uh, for their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and so imagine if you could actually just live <laughs> in those places all the time and work, and I wonder what our mental health would be all the time. It's kind of what I was thinking when you said that. Anyway. Yeah. That's all. Dimitri, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this with the deurbanization de and connecting maybe to education, which is your passion? Uh, um, it's maybe not the education. I have quite a lot of thoughts about that. Um, uh, and it's really interesting to hear uh, what you're talking. But what I was missing uh, from your discussion right now is um, focus on people, because what we are building, we're building it for people. We're not building because we, we want to have my like more uh, urban city or whatever. We want that people um, uh, would like to live there. I am uh, like for six, seven years ago, I've been introduced to a community called Burning Man. Uh, and uh, it impressed me quite a lot uh, uh, because I came from the business side. So I was thinking a little bit more about like, okay, we make a decision, we do this and then like uh, sell to customers or whatever. But then when I realized that they're like, another level another type of dimension there uh, uh, so in my perspective it's more uh, it's more about people that should make those types of decision if it um, and and of course it will be more decentralized like like james showing uh, uh, those pictures about uh, decentralizing of uh, um, of like how do you extract water how do you uh, have your suppliers and everything uh, and uh, we already have proof that it works. Like uh, in Nevada, for like one week, there are like 80,000 people are moving to, to the desert without any infrastructure, and they built a really cool infrastructure, and then uh, really cool things happen. And then in two weeks from, uh, from the festival uh, being there, you will even never realize that there was something there just because uh, uh, one of the guidelines, they disappear from that festival without leaving the trace. And there, those types of festivals is around the world. Like we have in Denmark, 
we have also in Sweden these types of things. So I, I would uh, say that we need to focus on people and, and uh, from the government perspective uh, of view, uh, give possibilities for people to create those prototypes uh, to see if um, uh, what is working and, and, and what's not working. Uh, if I compare it what Helsingborg City is doing, uh, they are quite um, quite a lot of projects where uh, city people that working for municipality trying to listen for people that we are living in specific areas and do whatever uh, they suggest. So they have those suggestion box for each park where like people can come and say, oh, we would like to have this. And then they like, oh, perfect. If you would like, what do you need? And then people say, ah, oh, but we need to buy the old things. Oh, perfect. If it's only like 10,000 kronos here, 10,000 kronos, buy and do something. So so a lot of like this mindset uh, starting to, to be implemented in different areas in Helsingborg uh, where where people are make those decisions, not not the political, not the, not the businessman that like okay it should be greenhouse should be placed here. No, no, let let, let people make those decisions and of course support them. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I want to move a little bit over to what's also in in the the presentation. It says going from best of world consumption to best of world regeneration, and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, our, our world and our, our, our countries and, and, and cities and society in a whole are very much built on, on consumption and uh, that is connected to, to, to growth and what is uh, um, associated with, with success. Uh, <clears throat> but um, going into building the future, I think we will see or we will need uh, other ways of measure uh, success and, and to manage this uh, transformation from these current systems to what's to be in the future. Magnus, I know that you've been um, very much involved with, with cities and, and uh, authorities, politicians, decision leaders, etc. Uh, what would you uh, comment on, on, on this transition that is needed? Because I think um, there will be a lot of um, uh, hard work to, to break some of those existing um, um, uh, systems going into the future or transforming them at, at yeah. least. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're pointing of uh, perhaps one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have. I mean, it seems like we're working quite good on, on sustainable systems when it comes to uh, decline the, the amount of fossil, fru f uh, fossil fuels, etc., and uh, limiting the, the spread of CO2 and other uh, of those gases. However, um, our economical system is uh, is another thing. It seems to be much much tougher. We can see now how we have a, a economical crisis globally when we are buying the things we only need uh, at the moment. So so there, this is uh, very very challenging. I think to break the, the the system and transform it to something more sustainable and um, a more sustainable consumption. Uh, it's it's exciting, and I have the uh, I have no answer to to the dilemma, but it it's uh, it's something that needs to be addressed, and it cannot be addressed in in the old way of thinking. There there needs to be something new coming up in, in this. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know James, you have been meeting a lot of people uh, all over the the world uh, in, in all different kind of. Of, of levels in society, if you say so. Uh, could you please comment on, on this a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to uh, consumption and demand, again, our entire thesis is to try to provide um, as much of the critical life support systems with doorstep access and agency. This also happens to be, have connectivity to what are called blue zones around the world where people are living to 100, 110 years old never seeing doctor, never taking pharmaceuticals. It has everything to do with that connectivity, living within nature and not separate from it. So every time we have these conversations about sustainability and urban areas and, and, and cities, um, I'm always um, a little bit um, suspicious that we're missing some of the key points there of having people have access to, to those same natural resource flows that we are part of. 
and and so that's really the whole the whole case for trying to look initially at least at greenfield areas outside of cities uh, and then bring some of that uh, those pieces back into uh, urban areas in, in the right way but things for sure are not going back to the way they were there are countries now that are holding back food stuffs and supplies um, and there are just these trends where more and more people are growing stuff next to their door wherever possible uh, so it's a it's it's a if COVID has really forced this whole idea uh, straight to the fore. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Dmitry, Marina, want to come comment on this? Uh, going from consumption to regenerative. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the the trust has been broken, in the yeah in the system in the food supply system in the sense that we have understood how. Uh, yeah, fragile and non-resilient is our system can be, um, especially when it's glo so globalized and it relies on you know overseas shipping and and so on, and how unsustainable that is. So we cannot think that this will be the the, the normal in you know I don't know how many years exactly, but in 20, 20 years maybe uh, we cannot expect maybe to import the same amount of products from abroad and the same type of product like exotic products, fruits and vegetables. So yeah, I would say I, I do notice this trend and it's a big trend to do gardening is <laughs> so true. And I think that um, uh, personally, I would, um, um, yeah, I always struggle with this idea of learning myself. And I think that everybody should know how to grow their own vegetables. And we did it as a hobby when I was a, a child because I did live in a small town, but a uh, village. Uh, but I say I would say that today uh, we need more of a system um, approach. Uh, if you're in a city and if you can afford it then I think the concept of regenerative um, that we showed uh, would be very appealing as an as an idea and but I, I, I assume it will be a bit of a bit of a luxury that not everybody can afford and it seemed to be that what you described is that the trend would be that um, I, I hope that uh, whatever happens outside the city where the food growing capacity uh, uh, takes place um, would be also supplying and giving uh, the same access to maybe the surplus, I guess, uh, to the people in the city that maybe will be less resilient and uh, able to rely on the uh, production if communities produce their own food um, in that kind of scenario. Yeah, well, the more, the more of these kinds of communities that you build, the more uh, abundant surplus you create of artisanal, organic, biodynamic, bioavailable kind of nutrition. Which is which is what we're not we're not getting much of anymore, uh, living in cities anyway. So or in the countryside. So we need to change the way we farm, and we need to change the way we eat and think. Um, all of those things are are happening now. So uh, yeah, absolutely. It's it's really about trying to just create the circumstances and the infrastructure. I just want to say very quickly that right now we're facing these green transition funds in the trillions, and we need to compel our government. Just this little message throw out to the Swedish government who's ever watching. Um, let's do this. Let's look at some pilots we got going in Uppsala, in, in Gotland, uh, in Eslav, uh, you know, Umia. We've been all over with Regen Villages, the north, south, east, and west. And, um, and we know that we can do this together. Well, thank you so much. Uh, time is uh, sort of. Uh, flying away here and, and uh, it's uh, soon it's 45 minutes. So I think we should uh, try to respect uh, that time limit. Uh, but uh, just very briefly before we end this off, a uh, uh, very quick take on or, or what do you take with you? Uh, we should start with, with Magnus. Want to take with session. me from, from, from the, the session. session? Yeah. Um, I, th I think uh, we have just briefly touched upon it, but uh, I, just the fact that we are, we are from different parts of the world participating in this. I think the globalization uh, will continue, even though we might have had a time wh where we see some uh, backlash, but that is probably just bump in the road. And, and connect this way is something I take with me uh, via uh, uh, online uh, sessions, etc., because it actually connects uh, in, in a much larger scale. Uh, so that's for the format uh, from this one. And uh, I also 
um, here that there is a trend or there is a an, um, uh, period of time where people actually are moving out of the city. And it was mentioned that it's the people with uh, high incomes or with a lot of money that is the first movers leaving the cities. And I think that uh, that's, uh, will be a concern. Uh, you mentioned earlier about politicians and uh, tax systems, uh, municipal tax is quite high in Sweden comparing to other countries. How will, the, how will our politicians react to, to such a movement where uh, the, the bigger cities will become poor in, in that sense of way when rich people moving out. Thank you, Magnus. James, please. Uh, well, my takeaway, and I had a lovely time here today, so thank you, uh, is it's really about uh, entrepreneurism and education and, uh, and sustainability and, and uh, nice to have the voice also, Magnus, of of urban areas, I think it's very important dialogue between all of us to to look at the bridges between um, nature and nurture, and that's basically all we're talking about here: is the substrate, the systems to support thriving, flourishing for a healthy planet and species. Full stop. Thank you, Marina. Please, what's your take quickly? <laughs> Yes, I take away my uh, reflection about uh, where to live and what's best from a, a food system perspective. I would love to have that conversation with my friends and see what we, we together come up with. I will definitely bring up the regenerative concept and uh, yeah, just reflect a bit uh, more about what's the best way. <laughs> Good, thank you. Dimitri, do you want to say something uh, too at the end? I'm really impressed uh, about James' project uh, that he shows. It's, it's, um, really good and my takeaway is that uh, we have plenty of things to do uh, to reach uh, there so, so like uh, let's start and do something and uh, it, it, it's really cool to, to like to get to know and, and get inspired to, to be able to to make some changes uh, for real super well thank you so much uh, everybody in the panel thank you so much uh, uh, the organization behind this uh, ship uh, of a new story and of course, to all of you listening out there, joining us uh, today for this session for uh, building the future and uh, good luck with uh, getting the shovel into the ground or the propeller into the water and start moving forward into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye Mats. everybody. Bye. Thank you.